see what God is doing. May we say it together, please? See what God is doing. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shed his blood for our sins and ransomed us and set us free and made us your children. And we come to worship you and to listen to you, to meet you. Father, please open our hearts and our ears and let us hear your word. Let us meet you at this time. Please help me share this message with your spirit and grace. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. The key verse is verse 22. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Amen. In today's passage, Jesus is doing the life-giving work of the Messiah. But at the same time, John the Baptist was in prison. And John sent messengers to Jesus to ask him, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? It indicates uncertainty, even doubt. Jesus said to them, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. And through this report, Jesus wanted John to see what God was doing and plant a conviction in John's heart that God was on the throne, ruling and carrying out his good purpose without fail. Like John, we can doubt God's love, his goodness, and his power when we see all kinds of terrible things happening. Social injustice, mass shootings, wars, COVID outbreaks, severe storms, wildfires, political scandals, and economic woes. We also see painful relationship problems in our families and trouble in our church community. When we see these things, we fall into sorrow and distress. We feel helpless and hopeless. And we may even think, God is indifferent to my suffering. But that is not true. In the midst of all these things, God is doing life-giving work. We need to see what God is doing. Let's pray to see what God is doing through this passage today. Amen. In order to help people see what God is doing, Jesus demonstrated the work of the Messiah. He commended the life and ministry of John and revealed the spiritual condition of his generation. First, Jesus demonstrated the work of the Messiah, verses 18 to 23. Verse 18a says, John's disciples told him about all these things. What are all these things? These are the things Jesus was doing. Proclaiming the good news, healing a centurion's dying servant with just one word, and raising a dead young man back to life. God was working mightily through the Messiah. It was a time of transition. Until then, John's ministry had been very popular. Everyone went to him to be baptized. 
But when John was imprisoned, his ministry dwindled. At that time, Jesus was preaching the good news, healing the sick, and driving out evil spirits. Many people were going to Jesus. This is what John's disciples reported to John. Then John sent two of his disciples to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Why did John do this? While sitting in prison, John was lonely. He worried about the future of Israel and about his disciples. When he heard about God's mighty work through Jesus, he was happy, but he still had questions in his heart. He was a righteous man, and he believed God's righteous judgment, and that evil should be punished and righteousness upheld. But Jesus was not focusing on fighting against social injustice. He didn't work for John's release from prison. He didn't even visit John in prison. Jesus spent his time among common, even notorious people, humbly serving them. It was not what John expected. So he wondered if Jesus really was the Messiah. To answer the question, John did not rely on his own insight or understanding. He asked the question to Jesus. Furthermore, John sent Jesus to his di- John sent his disciples to Jesus for their sake. They were in a spiritual crisis. They felt sorry for John and for themselves. Nobody was coming to them anymore. They felt like has-beens in God's work, and they worried about their future. John was really concerned about them, even more than himself. He did not send send them to Jesus to ask for his release but for them to have conviction that Jesus is the Messiah. John was really a good shepherd for his disciples. When they went to Jesus, he was doing amazing things, curing many who had diseases, sicknesses, evil spirits, giving sight to many who were blind. Those suffering from paralysis and leprosy were healed completely. And they were singing and dancing and praising God. Those who had been tormented by evil spirits were set free, shouting glory to God. The blind received sight and they could see Jesus and see their loved ones. People were filled with wonder and awe at what Jesus was doing. So Jesus replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Amen. Jesus' answer was not, yes, I am the one. He demonstrated he is the Messiah through his works. And then he related his works to the prophecy from Isaiah. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6 say, Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. 
Isaiah 61, 1a says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Just as Isaiah prophesied, Jesus was doing the work of the Messiah. It was work only the Messiah could do. It was indisputable evidence. Jesus is the Messiah. As we analyze the Messiah's works, we can discover the character of our God. God heals. God restores. God liberates. God gives life. God is good. God is good. And God is mighty God. And God saves his people who believe in him. This is our God. And his miraculous work is not just an old, old story. It continues to this day. Did you know there's a great work of God in the Pacific Northwest? Forty years ago, there was one small and lonely UBF chapter on the West Coast at Oregon State University, where Pastor Abraham Kim's family and a few students, including me, met for Bible study and worship. We frequently prayed to God for his blessing on the Pacific Northwest. Last month, together with Pastor John Sa, I visited major cities there. Seattle, Washington, Vancouver, British Columbia, Victoria, British Columbia, Portland, Oregon. We saw six flourishing house churches. They are led by dedicated families with vibrant faith and missionary vision. And through them, God is raising disciples. For example, in Victoria, missionaries Joshua and Helen Park have humbly raised their sons, Joshua and James, as their co-workers. And now these men are humbly, prayerfully, lovingly teaching the Word of God to fellow college students. Recently, Joshua Jr. was engaged to Joanna Cho of Washington, and they pray to establish a Jesus-centered, mission-oriented house church. There are many other growing disciples. When I saw them, I was amazed. Wow! Praise the Lord! Amen. God is working in many other countries, even in Ukraine. Deborah in Odessa has been actively teaching the Bible, and God blessed her ministry by raising a disciple. Vlad of Podil UBF decided to live as a pastor for his people, no matter what happens. At the age of 23, he preaches powerful Sunday messages in Kiev at this time, every Sunday. God's work is going on. God's work is going on. Even in the midst of terrible war. And God is working mightily in the USA. Last week, Kahari Willis, a 26-year-old football player, suddenly retired, giving up millions of dollars and great fame. Why? He posted on Instagram to devote the remainder of my life to the further advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am both humbled and excited to pursue the holy call that God has for my life, which brings me much joy and purpose. Praise the Lord! There are always elements of darkness in our world, but we must see beyond these things and see the work God is doing. God is doing mighty work. Let's see what God is doing. No, don't just look at the iPhone, at the news, or the TV news, or listen to gossip, or ridiculous celebrities. 
We're corrupted athletes. Look at what God is doing. And God will give you life. God will give you victory. God will give you peace. And you'll be transformed. And you'll be so happy. And live victoriously. I'm sorry I got so excited. <clears throat> okay, calm down. After demonstrating that he is the Messiah, Jesus said this. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Why did he say this? It meant that John's disciples needed to make a decision of faith. They heard the good news. They saw what Jesus was doing. Now they needed to accept it and trust in him. But there was a danger that they would fall away if they clung to their own expectation of the Messiah. They could miss what Jesus was doing. They must have accept, expected Jesus to set John free, restore their ministry, make their lives great again. But Jesus came to do much more than what they were expecting. Jesus came as our Messiah, who suffered and died on a cross for us. And God raised him from the dead to give us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life and an inheritance in his glorious kingdom. Most of all, we need to see Jesus he reveals God's love for us. He reveals God's grace to us. He sets us free to serve his holy mission and gives us the Holy Spirit. He satisfies our souls with joy and peace. Jesus promises these blessings to all who trust in him. Even in the midst of agonies, and trouble and distress in our personal lives. When we trust in Jesus, he blesses us abundantly. As I looked back on my life, I found times that I expected something from Jesus, but he blessed me in another way. When I was a young shepherd, it was very important for me to build up a healthy, vibrant fellowship. One day, Satan attacked my ministry, and several promising disciples left. At the same time, another young servant's ministry was growing and growing and growing week after week. And I was really sorry. Wow, why doesn't my fellowship grow? His grows. Mine doesn't grow. And in frustration, I wondered... Should I continue to live as a Bible teacher? And then Jesus' words spoke to me. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of him. When our expectations are not met, it's time to change our expectations and accept Jesus based on his word and his truth. When I did so, repenting from my heart, Jesus opened my eyes to see all Chicago ministry is my stewardship and all America is my mission field. Another time, I was in deep agony over the spiritual condition of someone. Though I cried out in prayer, the person did not change. Instead, Jesus changed me. He brought me to the cross and showed me the depth of his love and his saving grace. And I found new hope and new vision. And at the same time, he opened my heart to accept many people as his precious children. 
There was also a time when I was deeply grieved over a conflict with someone. Though I tried hard, it was not resolved, and Jesus didn't seem to answer my prayer. And this robbed me of joy in serving the Lord. And then Jesus gave me John 14, 3. I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may be where I am. And I deeply accepted Jesus' great love and the living hope in the kingdom of God. My joy was restored and my sense of mission sharpened all the more. We have our own expectations of Jesus Christ. And sometimes these expectations are not met. In those times, it's important for us to adjust ourselves. Don't keep demanding from Jesus, but trust in his sovereign love. Trust in his saving grace. Believe what he has given you is the best. All the spiritual blessings are the best. Then we can stand in Jesus Christ. We don't stumble. We don't fall. We can stand firm, see things from God's point of view, and live as his disciples to the end. Second, Jesus commended John the Baptist, verses 24 to 28. After John's messengers left, Jesus spoke to the crowd about John. He wanted them to see John from God's point of view. He wanted them to understand how God was working through John. He asked them, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. In these verses, Jesus compares different kinds of people in order to remind the crowd why they were so attracted to John. One kind of person is like a reed swayed by the wind. These are very weak people. No identity, no clear value system. They lack conviction based on the truth. They're easily swayed by public opinion, temptation, persecution. John was not like that. He had such courageous faith. He rebuked King Herod to repent of his sin of adultery. Another kind of person is a man dressed in fine clothes. This kind of person pursues money and power and indulges in luxury to see his picture on magazine covers. They care nothing for others. They exploit the weak for their own benefit. Outwardly, they look successful. They look like objects of envy. But inwardly, they are corrupt and miserable. They live as the ruling class, those in palaces. In contrast, John the Baptist lived in the wilderness. He ate locusts and wild honey. His clothing was made of camel's hair. He was not a trendsetter in fashion. Finally, Jesus mentioned a prophet. A prophet is a godly person who pursues truth and holiness and fights against evil. A prophet is a person of mission who preaches the word of God in his times. Prophets live for the salvation of others, not their own ease and comfort. They do not compromise with the world. They live by faith in God, no matter what. God blesses. God recognizes. God uses such people. And this is why they went to John. John was a prophet. And when they went to him, they experienced God's presence. 
With this reminder, Jesus wanted to awaken their consciences. He wanted to sharpen their spiritual discernment and help them see through the appearance of things and understand what God was doing. Jesus went on to call John more than a prophet. He said, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And then Jesus said, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Jesus Christ commended John as a great man. John's greatness came from his mission as the forerunner of the Messiah. And to carry out this mission, he preached repentance in his time and turned people's hearts to Jesus. He became very popular, but he never accepted honor and recognition. He turned people to Jesus, and he said of Jesus, He must become greater. I must become less. And when John poured out his life and exalted Jesus Christ in this way, he became a truly great man and a source of good influence. And then Jesus added, Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And this puts John into perspective in God's history. John was an Old Testament prophet. Old Testament prophets looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. Among them, John's place was special. He was the forerunner right before the Messiah. But still, he belonged to the Old Covenant. On the other hand, those who believe in Jesus are members of the New Covenant, members of God's kingdom. The New Covenant is superior to the Old because its members experience the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who sanctifies, purifies, empowers, and changes us on the inside to be more and more like Jesus Christ. This is why those who trust in Jesus are truly great in the sight of God. In this section, let's remember one very important thing. We need to remember how God has worked in our lives. This is so important. It gives us discernment. It gives us perspective. It gives us context so that we can see the work of God and not be deceived by all the false teachings and lies and deception of this world. Third, Two responses to God's work. In verses 29 and 30, Luke explains how people responded to God's work. First of all, people, even tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right. It was because they had been baptized by John. This means they recognize sin. They are sinners. They repented of their sin before God and before man. They believed in Jesus Christ. This is God's way of salvation. We must recognize ourselves as sinners. Repent of our sin and believe in Jesus. This is the only way of salvation that God has ordained. Peter declared, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We must follow God's way of salvation to receive this wonderful grace. We see another response in verse 30. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves. It was because they had not been baptized by John. 
When John came preaching repentance, they said, who are you? You're just a desert boy. I'm a religious leader. Look at my fancy clothes. And they rejected his message. And when they did so, they remained in spiritual blindness. They could not see Jesus right there before their eyes. And in rejecting the Messiah, they rejected God's purpose for themselves, destined to an empty, meaningless life and eventually eternal condemnation. In verses 31 to 34, Jesus speaks to his generation. Not everyone, but the religious leaders and those under their influence. Jesus compared them to children sitting in the marketplace, playing all kinds of games, playing video games, all night long. Video games, children's games, all night. They didn't do what they should do. They, didn't, they weren't mature in their thought. They didn't see God or what he was doing, but just wasted their time in foolishness. These religious leaders were just like that. Fancy, well-educated religious leaders were just like that. John the Baptist came. He didn't eat bread or drink wine. And they said, oh, we're not going to accept your message. You're demon-possessed. And then Jesus came. And Jesus is eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners to be friends with them and win them over to God. And they said, we're not going to accept you. You're too liberal. Ah, you're no good. They rejected John. They rejected Jesus. Who are they going to accept? No one. No one who teaches God's way was acceptable to them. They were not going to go God's way, no matter how it was packaged. They were stubborn, unrepentant, and ignoring the work of God in their time, no matter how it happened. We don't need to be too sensitive to the opinions of people like this. We don't need to worry or be afraid or uh, weaken our Christian witness because of people like this. We must stand firm in Jesus Christ, in this sin sick and corrupted culture, and preach Christ to those who are perishing. In verse 35, Jesus concluded, But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Here, wisdom is God's way, God's truth. When God's children live by God's way, amazing things happen. They change. They become joyful. They become powerful. They become dynamic people. Their lives are so blessed and so fruitful. And it gives very clear evidence God's way is right. Which way do you want to live? Do you want to live by God's way? I'm going to ask one more time. Answer with yes. Do you want to live by God's way? Amen. Let's live by God's way. Let's become the people who reveal Christ in our times. The people who challenge the darkness with the light of Christ. A holy people. A shepherd people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Then life is worth living. It has meaning and purpose. And we're going to bear everlasting fruit and inherit the kingdom of God. What a glorious future.
for those who go God's way. In today's passage, we learn that God is working mightily, even in the midst of all the troubles of our time and in the midst of our own issues and problems. We shouldn't be blinded by the darkness of the world. We shouldn't be blinded by introspection regarding our own problems all the time. We need to come out of ourselves and see what God is doing. And then God gives us power and peace and joy and discernment. And we can live as children of God in this thin sick generation. May God bless each of us to see what God is doing and live for God's purpose in our own generation. Mm -hmm.